Then concurrent session four, sustainable aviation shall now commence. First of all, I would like to introduce two moderators for the session. Professor Dr. Georg Erbman, Mr. Vikram Singh Mita. Professor Dr. Georg Erdman is ICEF Steering Committee, retired chair of Energy Systems, Faculty of Process Engineering, Berlin University of Technology, president on, of the board, KSB Energy AG Berlin. And Mr. Vikram Shimida is ICEF Steering Committee, chairman of Center for Social and Economic Progress Research Foundation. So now I would like to ask Professor Dr. Erdman to moderate the session. Professor Dr. Erdman, if you please. Thank you very much, and welcome back to the sessions after the lunch break. We have today a very uh, demanding and challenging topic, because um, maybe you agree that uh, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, aviation uh, is more difficult to reduce than probably any other type of emission source. Um, in addition, the number of technologies which are available are in a very early stage, so that means we, we will not be able to change the world very soon. Today, the share of global, the emission share of aviation is about 2%. And uh, regarding the progress other sectors can make, road transportation, electric generation, etc., it will simply be a, 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 the result that the relative share of air transportation will increase. That means the problem of, of uh, today, you say 2%, it is not a big deal, but uh, in the future, uh, the aviation sector will have a larger share. And many repre representatives of the industry and the uh, airline, the, the plane building industry, are aware about this problem. And therefore, uh, they started to think about alternatives and to, to, to think about the future. Of course, they also think that sooner or later governments will, will intervene and, and force them to do something and to be prepared. There is a lot of things going on. And this session we have today, we will discuss these topics. In principle, you have two major roads in towards, towards reducing greenhouse gas. One is designing different type of planes. And I think uh, NATO is doing uh, research on this topic. And the second is changing the fuels. And for changing the fuels, we have three options. One is hydrogen, one is sustainable aviation fuels, and one is electricity. Today on the podium, we have four distinguished speakers, and uh, we will, we, two of them will talk about sustainable aviation fuels, and two of them will speak on electricity. So we, we reduce the, the complex topic of uh, sustainable aviation to two uh, aspects, which allow us to have focused discussion about these two aspects. So let me introduce the speakers. The first one is Mr. Hirito Enomoto-san. He is from NEDO, director of the Technology Strategy Center. Our second speaker is Mr. Yuki Nikishamu Nishimura-san, sorry for that. Uh, she, she is program manager, um, uh, JGC Holdings, um, and uh, he will also speak on sustainable aviation fuels. And then we have uh, online uh, Ms. Ada Tse uh, from uh, Hong Kong. And uh, she is uh, director of Vola Air Mobility, other a company, and uh, she will talk on electric, electricity, battery, aviation. And uh, finally, Miss Laura Leonzini, Leonzini, she is from Switzerland, um, a company called Eaton. Um, and um, uh, this company is also developed in the infrastructure of um, uh, electricity at airports. 
So I think we have a good, um, good podium and we have interesting speakers. And of course, uh, my, uh, my co-moderator, uh, he will uh, intervene after the four speakers have presented their speech. So let us uh, start with uh, Inomoto-san. Thank you, Chairs. This is Hiroshi Inomoto from NEDO. Now I'm talking about the fuel, uh, liquid fuel. And uh, in my unit, uh, we are making the technology strategies for uh, SAF, the SAF. Uh, this is liquid fuel. And uh, in the uh, aviation fuels, uh, we have several targets. Uh, in, nine, uh, in 2050, uh, we uh, the global SAF demand should be around uh, 300 million uh, cubic meter or 400 million cubic meters. And in Japan, uh, we predict uh, almost 20 million cubic meters should be necessary. On the other hand, in 2030, in Japan, we need almost 2 million cubic meters. And in 2020, uh, the global SAF supply is uh, 0 0.063 million cubic meters, so it's very small. And the SAF production cost is from 2 USD dollars to uh, 16 USD dollars. And the conventional aviation fuel cost is almost 1 US dollars. And uh, in NEDO, uh, we decide uh, 30, 13 technologies in 2017. And uh, in 2019, uh, from these three, uh, 13 technologies, uh, we choose three technologies. One is uh, alcohol to jet. The second is uh, gasification and uh, fissure trops. The third is microalgae and hydro process. Uh, they are for after 2030 uh, process, uh, so n not the recent uh, technologies. And to uh, find uh, these uh, advantages, uh, we have to think about uh, carbon neutral production and enough supply. The two points are very important. And uh, we decide the approx approximations of uh, one is uh, the production rate, because uh, we need a large amount of stuff. And uh, in these uh, approximations, uh, we have to decide uh, which utility should be used. And uh, we decide that uh, any utilities should be from the raw materials. And in any case, we should we should talk about the number of labels because the cost is very high. And we compare these three technologies with the four uh, indexes. Firstly, uh, we show about the alcohol to jet A to J. And in large scale, the raw material cost is dominant. Uh, this means that uh, alcohol should be from uh, cellulose or waste. So uh, uh, this means so the cost is very important. And on the other hand, in the small scale, the labor, co labor of X is dominant. The labor fee is very high. This means that uh, the full automatic uh, plant could be adapted in local, local usage. The second one is gasification and fissure trops. Uh, in the large scale, raw material cost and capex are dominant. Uh, this means that the plant should be placed at the low material production area and that low price gas fire is necessary. In small scale, uh, in the same of A to J, uh, labor OPEX is dominant. So uh, the, some automatic uh, plants should be developed. 
And thirdly, the microalgae technology uh, should be considered. But uh, the advantage of microalgae is the gro growth rate. Uh, almost 10 times of other plant could be uh, achieved. And in any case, uh, we talk about gene uh, recombination, but uh, in NEDO project, it is not necessary. So we can install uh, our technology in any place. However, the effective CO2 supply technology is very important, and we should uh, develop uh, this technology. Any case, we need uh, the forest because the source of these uh, fuels are a biomass or a wood. So, uh, for example, uh, from FAO, uh, we can find several uh, data of the forest. Uh, the forest around the Pacific Ocean, so because uh, we are in Japan, uh, Asian and uh, uh, Oceania uh, can supply almost 30 percent of global uh, need surf demand from wood. And microalgae in NEDO uh, project can supply almost 100 percent of global uh, surf demand from these forests. And conclusions. Uh, these three technologies uh, as follows are evaluated. The first, uh, alcohol to jet, A to J, will be a solution with low price alcohol. The second, a gasification and fissure top technology could be uh, constructed with uh, small capacity in any place. Third, uh, microalgae and the hydro process, process uh, could uh, with carbon uh, renewal CO2, uh, a neutral CO2 uh, has the largest growth rate. Uh, in case of one million cubic meter per year production rate, uh, the rate of raw material cost is large in any case, in any three technologies. So uh, the plan should be placed at the low uh, material production area. And each, uh, any uh, technologies need hydrogen and water. The, the two uh, materials is very important. Uh, so uh, the carbon intensity of these of them should be uh, evaluated. Then, uh, as a plant of the a plant or the praise for the sorry praise for the. Uh, something should be uh, decided uh, to make the carbon intensity uh, minimum. Uh, that may be the same of hydrogen case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Enomoto-san. Our second speaker is Mr. Yuki Nishimura-san. Please. You have the floor. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, your introduction. And I'm, I'm sorry, very complicated pronunciation for you. Again, my name is Nishimura of JGC Holdings Corporation. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce my company, JGC. So our company, JGC, has been established in 1928. And uh, as a uh, as a EPC contractor uh, for various kind of plants, the EPC means engineering, procurement, and construction of, for the various kind of plants and factories. So our current business is mainly refinery and gas processing and LNG and chemicals, uh, which consists of uh, more than 70% uh, of total our sales. However. Uh, today, uh, paradigm shifts uh, in the society and, and industry are uh, occurring at an unprecedented speed. So our uh, business environment is uh, changing dramatically. 
So in order for JGC Group to, uh, uh, to achieve uh, sustainable growth, so now uh, we are going to uh, change our, our uh, business model. So with this mind, uh, we have redefined our purpose of the company, uh, which is uh, enhancing planetary health. And we have, uh, uh, we have uh, our uh, policy is uh, uh, going to be realized this enhancing planetary health. So by uh, 2040, uh, by 2040, uh, so our company is uh, going to uh, realize our uh, these uh, five uh, domains. Uh, our business model we, we changed to into the five business models, so including energy transition. So. Uh, in, uh, in order to realize our, uh, our purpose of the company, uh, we have started to develop our uh, completely new business force. The SAF business is one of that, so uh, by a cross-industry partnership. So uh, here is the, our uh, partners. The Cosmo Oil is the, one of the biggest refiner in Japan. And uh, Lebo International is the pioneering biodiesel supplier in Japan uh, who has a uh, uh, wide uh, collecting network of used cooking oil from the nation. Then we have established the Sapphire Sky Energy last year uh, through the uh, joint investment uh, with uh, Cosmo Oil and Lebo International. Then Sapphire will produce a SAF as well as uh, bio nafta and uh, renewable diesel uh, from the uh, do domestically collected used cooking oil with heifer uh, technologies. Uh, our uh, supply, uh, supply of the cap uh, SAF capacity will be approximately 30,000 kiloliters per year, and the production will start from the 2025. So. And this project is supported and subsidized by NEDO, so uh, I would like to take this opportunity to express my appreciation, appreciation to NEDO. So uh, as a first mover of the SAF supplier in Japan, uh, we are facing several challenges to introduce SAF in Japan. Then uh, under this situation, uh, it is very important and uh, essential uh, that the people uh, recognize the value of SAF uh, because SAF and the conventional jet fuel has almost the same uh, quality as fuel. There is nothing uh, different uh, in terms of the uh, quality of the fuel. So that is why uh, we have established uh, a voluntary organization, Act for Sky, to create the value on SAF. Uh, as a decarbonization uh, solution for the aviation sector. So as of uh, September this year, uh, 30 members are participating in Act for Sky from the various kind of sector. So this, the members are not only for the domestic company, as well, uh, also the, uh, the company from overseas, uh, like Boeing or Airbus is participating in this uh, organization. Uh, this is the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nishimura-san. Uh, I think our two first speakers really addressed somehow the problem of resources. Do we have enough resources, or can we arise enough resources for this sustainable aviation fuels? But the discussion will follow after the next two presentations, which will talk on battery elect electrical airplanes. The first speaker in this block is Ada C. Son. And she is online on the screen. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, firstly, I must apologize uh, for not being able to join you in Tokyo today. And I'm grateful to Mr. Moderators 
and the event organizer for allowing me to present online. I think they're going to play a video um, of a recording that I made um, uh, previously. So please go ahead with the video. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good afternoon. My name is Ada Chia, and I am the co-founder and director of Vola Air Mobility, a Hong Kong-based green aerial ride hailing company aiming to catalyze the global adoption of environmentally responsible traveling alternatives. Today, I am honored to share with you the alternative aircraft technology in combating the pressing issue of climate change. Let's start by considering the staggering environmental impact of traditional air travel. According to Deloitte, a return flight from London to New York City generates about one ton of CO2 per passenger. That's nearly the same as what an average person in a developing country produces in a year. This highlights the urgent need to find sustainable aviation alternatives and ultimately to reduce the effects of global warming. In view of this, we founded VOLA in 2020 and started our journey with a primary focus on looking for a sustainable private aviation solution. We came across a university in Shenyang in China, which was about to submit its type certification application for a four-seater electric aircraft, the RX-4E. Once type certificate is issued, the RX-4E may potentially be the first commercially approved electric four-seater aircraft in the world. The aircraft itself has a fixed wing design similar to conventional Cessna and Piper models. While many may see this as being boring, there, therein lies the unique proposition as the design is familiar to many, proven to be safe and reliable, and therefore reducing regulatory uncertainties in certifying this new aircraft model. Additionally, given the abundance and underutilization of small airport runway strips in developing countries, ESTOS, which stands for Electric Short View Takeoff and Landing, bring a plethora of beneficial use cases, enabling quick adoption, making use of existing infrastructure without the environmentally intrusive and capital intensive approach of building new charging and transportation infrastructures. Applications of the RX4E aircraft are wide be it feeder services for residents in rural areas and their products to assess urban markets, or delivering essential logistics and critical medical supplies to remote communities, or can be done in an environmentally friendly manner. To demonstrate the efficacy of green aviation and the benefits it brings to local communities, Vola's first proof of concept will be to use our four-seater electric aircraft to conduct scenic flights to promote green ecotourism in Mount Rajani, Indonesia, as shown in the following video. Imagine soaring through the sky, admiring an incredible panoramic view of a natural reserve, a serene lake, lush tropical jungles, and an active volcano all in one magnificent journey. Welcome to the world's first electric plane rider, Mount Rangani. Nestled in Lombok Island, the volcano is a popular tourism hub in Indonesia. With our electric plane, we are now offering a private, environmentally conscious way of adoring the breathtaking sceneries of Mount Rangani. This is more than a ride. It's a thrilling journey towards building a sustainable planet for our children and future generation. Mount Rinjani, brought together by Vola, pioneering green aviation, and SPI, enabling green ecotourism. Compared to the conventional way of visiting Mount Rinjani, which usually involves a hike up to the mountain in three days, two nights, the provision of green aviation has three benefits. Number one, no more rubbish left behind on the mountain by hikers, thus preserving the natural environment. Number two, enables people who are less physically fit to enjoy the majestic view. Number three, 
Tourists now only need to spend two hours to visit Mount Rajani, allowing them more time for other activities, thus creating multiplier economic benefits. With examples like Mount Rajani in Indonesia, Vola aims to put together an impactful strategy to deploy a series of green aircraft around the world. As advocates of public interest capitalism, Vola's mission statement addresses the three E's, namely empowerment, enablement, and education. Let me explain. Firstly, we endeavor to empower communities to participate in pioneering green aviation. By engaging with community stakeholders of all levels, such as regulators, academia, industry players, and consumers, we can foster a sense of ownership and responsibility to choose an environmentally friendly alternative. This ensures that green aviation initiatives are aligned with societal needs. Secondly, we aspire to enable a green mobility option for sustainable development. Through green aviation, we hope to give consumers a choice to address the needs for air travel without guilty conscience and concurrently, create additional benefits in growing sustainable sectors, such as ecotourism. Thirdly, we seek to educate the communities on decarbonization merits. By educating and raising awareness about sustainable travel options and environmental impact, we can encourage individuals to promote a greener ecosystem for our youth and future generations. In conclusion, Sustainable aviation has the potential to be a powerful catalyst for sustainable development in emerging economies. We at VOLA would like to encourage all of us to work collaboratively towards building a sustainable aviation future that provides meaningful societal benefits. Lastly, I would like to leave you with this quote. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ada Sefa-san. Uh, our last speaker is Ms. Laura Leontici uh, from uh, Eton in uh, Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, she oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, our uh, fourth speaker is Ms. Laura Leontici from uh, uh, Switzerland, uh, Lausanne. Uh, she's from a company is called Eaton, um, and uh, she will also address electric uh, planes. Hello, everybody. First of all, has anybody heard of Eaton before? Raise your hand. Okay, a couple. Another question unrelated. Has anybody flown electric before? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, one. One, you. Yeah. <laughs> so on the first slide, this is uh, my first solo. I am learning, um, I'm doing a PPL, private pilot license, and uh, it's to show that the aviation, electric aviation is, is not the future, it's the present. So that was me and my instructor on my first solo. The solo is the moment for a pilot where the pilot realizes oh, I'm actually a pilot and it's one of the best uh, feelings um, in your life if you're, of course, if you're also going to be a pilot. And um, what is interesting on this is that um, today I'm bringing a bit of a voice from Europe. So it's already happening. This revolution, uh, which is starting slowly and it's starting also like the, the, the previous speaker, with you know, two-seaters, four-seaters, but it's there. So it's, um, there's already airports that are equipping themselves with charging infrastructure for electric planes. There is today one electric plane that has received a certification. It's this one called Belis Electro by a Slovenian company uh, named Pipistrel. And Pipistrel was uh, recently acquired by Textron. Um, so th there is a, a w the willingness from the industry and the willingness also from the governments, although slowly, <laughs> uh, to increase the el electrification of, um, uh, of airplanes and of uh, aviation. So you might have heard of uh, AAM, Advanced Air Mobility, which is more concerning. The EVTOLs, let me just um, 
I'll go back to this one because it's a funny one. Um, so the, you, you have EVTOLs, which is the AM, called uh, the UAM, urban air mobility. So anything that goes basically from the cities um, and within you know, 50 to 100 miles um, around. So like a, a, a small radius, but interesting because it's sort of like the air taxi of the future. Uh, you have the general aviation, the first category, which, which is where we are right now, like presently operating. And um, so one to four seater, so also Volar Air. Uh, I like Volar because it's an Italian word. I'm from Italy, so it's, it means fly. So uh, Volar and also many other companies that are developing uh, electric aircraft are going to be you know, within this category. <clears throat> so it's a general aviation, it's a flight train, it's private pilots. There's there's lots of pilots who love to to fly. So it's it's in that let's say non-commercial area. And then the commercial, besides for the EVs that I just mentioned, it will be the small commercial aircraft, uh, which is something I personally believe in, um, which is the, is going to be boosting the region on air mobility. So you you can imagine something between 19 seaters and 30 seaters, and it will be electric and hybrids, because it's, you cannot have just purely electric for, for 30 seaters. The batteries are just not uh, small enough or light enough, and you have to fly that thing. So, um, and then you have the medium commercial aircraft, uh, so where we don't know where, where it's going to go. So, and, and talking about hydrogen, of course, today there's not enough uh, uh, time or people to talk about hydrogen, but that's more or like what we're looking at uh, for the for the long haul and and for for the commercial aircraft as we know it today, you know, the Airbuses and the Boeings. But we got to start somewhere, right? So, and this somewhere is uh, is here. So, this is uh, my company um, works for. Um, in energy transition. So it's basically everything has to do with uh, empowering um, hubs such as airports or buildings becoming resilient by producing local uh, local energy, sustainable energy, mixing it uh, intelligently with the grid energy, and then providing distribution and, and through through charging infrastructure uh, to on land side uh, with uh, charging stations for electric vehicles, which you may have seen already also in your country, and the land side, which is uh, charging infrastructure for electric aircraft. So this, this ecosystem um, is uh, manageable, it's already working, and with storage, which is the batteries that store, store energy, you can actually be able, you're able to balance the loads and be able to use the energy that you produce on site, also in times when, uh, when it's, it's not needed today, but it will be needed tomorrow, so by making it more flexible. Of course, it's uh, an energy transition that uh, involves a lot of actors, and, uh, and the governments, and we'll, I'll speak about it uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes, but it's, uh, it, this is the, uh, why this gentleman <laughs> is having a bit of a hard time. Uh, the, the, there are challenges that are, we're uh, in, affected with. You know, it's, uh, he, first of all, you know, what will be the main, the main challenge that the airports will face? And when I say airports, I also talk about buildings. You know, if you're familiar with the electrification of buildings, which is something happening happening in a more, you know, um, um, like a, on a day-to-day -day basis today. But in airports, it's happening and it will be happening even more. If you th think of the electrification of the ground um, equipment, the GSE, ground support equipment, that is already happening. All the forklift, all the material that that is needed, you know, the buses and the trolleys and so forth, that's already been electrified. On top of that, imagine now having uh, 20... 22 kilowatt charger, which is the, our present charger, for charging an, a Valley's Electro uh, for a 45 minute um, uh, auto, I mean, uh, endurance of the plane. And then in the near future, we're going to need more like a three, 400 kilowatt charger for an hour and a half or two hour endurance for four seaters to, to eight seaters. And this is going to increase drastically and quite exponentially the, the, the way that the airports are going to have to be equipped. So who's going to pay for it because if you look at uh, you know I was we were talking before and I was thinking always you know when you think stuff it's 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 an easier uh, game for me because you you do have already an infrastructure in place you got your tanks you got uh, the, the system is already in place so you just need just need to switch from uh, 
kerosene to SAF. So, so uh, LL, you know, 100 to, to SAF, 100 maybe. <laughs> and, um, but, but in the charging infrastructure, you, you need a charging infrastructure. You cannot just put electricity in the same tanks. Or, you know, so you need to bring the cable. Actually, you, you might need to have a substation next to the airport because the amount of energy that will be required is so high that you want, it won't be just with a, you know, with an electric charger for, for cars that, um, that we're going to get by. Um, and then are, are we learning our lessons from the automobile industry? Because now we've been 10 years in the making, and, the, and my company used to, you know, started with charging infrastructure for electric uh, vehicles. And there are all these lessons that, that we're learning uh, from the automobility. We can definitely apply 80% to, to aviation. So it's up to us to actually learn from the past. So if I look at the, uh, whether it's going to happen or not, a lot of companies are investing in it. And the market analysis are showing that there is uh, going to be a, a, a great increase. If you look at up to, you know, let, uh, up to the end of this decade, it's going to be quite, quite low. We're looking at, you know, we're counting in the dozens or hundreds in terms of aircraft today. I mean, today there's about 120 Valleys Electro, the only elect, you know, commercialized aircraft. But as of next year, we should get the uh, certification from other companies, um, hopefully Volar, and then uh, many others also based in the US, in Europe, and so forth. So it's going to be increasing. By the beginning of the next decade, that's where we're going to see it interestingly. The EV tolls are going to come up. The uh, the, the planes for, let's say, business jets, you know, up to eight seaters. The the first um, examples of uh, t 19 to 30 seaters. Think of hard aerospace in Sweden, and they're they're going to also get certified. Hopefully soon. They say about before the end of the decade. If that can happen, you know, I'll be very happy. So it, it, we're looking at uh, let's say 12,000 more or less aircraft by, you know, in 15 years. Um, it's, it doesn't sound like um, much maybe compared to the number of aircraft that's already there, but it's a huge revolution. Um, another revolution will be the chargers, because if you, I'm going to jump to this one first. If you look at the number of chargers you need today, think of, uh, of cars, you, you need today more chargers than a car, and then as as the as the actual charging infrastructure increases, then uh, and the number of cars increases, then you will the the number of cars and the number of chargers will be will will be equalized in a way. So you need uh, let's say 1.3 chargers today to to charge uh, an aircraft because if you go to a, from A to B, at least you have to have two chargers. You know, A to B to C, you need three chargers. You have one aircraft. You know, in the future you will have four aircraft and then we'll have and so forth. So um, if I look at the cumulative aircraft charges from now till 2036, we're looking at 23,000 charges and we put down a lot the, the study. We have, um, yeah, we have, we want it to be more conservative than, than what uh, other analyses have made. Um, but in other analyses, we're looking at more 40,000 charges. But um, let, let's look at it, at it in a conservative way between EV tolls, 90 passengers, private jets, small aircraft, will have about 23,000 uh, chargers cumulative in, in the next 15 years. That means a lot of power that will need to power up those chargers in order for the chargers to power up the planes. Um, so a, there is a, a, a need to look at the whole thing in an innovative way because there is an electrification need and, and challenge. Uh, the grids are already completely loaded, you know, I am, um, I was going from airport to airport to sell my charger, and then some airports have 16 amps. 16 amps allows for 11 kilowatt charging, whereas the charger for this plane is a 22 kilowatt charger, so at least you need 30, 32 amps. Um, and if, even for that, for the whole operation of a small airfield, they don't have that power. I imagine when we're going to look at a thousand kilowatt charger, one megawatt. So, um, so the charging infrastructure has the challenges, um, and it's more than what we're facing with, with electric vehicles on the ground today. Um, and then we, we need to be able to balance that load. So the energy transition has to be looked at from an airport perspective and from all the um, operators' per perspective. Um, 
And this is why we propose an airport as a grid approach. So basically you have, a, a, you, you, you see an airport as an energy hub. In order to f see it that way, with solar power, with uh, energy storage systems, with a software that intelligently links all these um, let's say utilities and, and the power distribution backbone for the charging system and so forth, possibly also GSE in the, on the ground in the, in the airports, you need to have all actors um, participate and, and you need also the government to say yes we're going to help because this is the, 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 the challenges you know to answer the questions at the beginning what are the main uh, challenges is to be ready in time and to look at the total cost of ownership when aircraft are talking about their machine and when they're going to be certified and they're going to sell their aircraft but they're not going to sell their aircraft plus the charger because they expect the charger to be already in place but the airport they come back to us and say, We'd, it's not up to us to, to, to install these chargers. It's too expensive. And so there's no ownership as to like who's responsible for this. Too expensive today, imagine tomorrow. So this is where the governments and, and subsidies are important because without subsidies and without incentivization from the government, like anything else in innovation world, they won't, we won't be able to increase that um, charging infrastructure. And uh, certification is another main hurdle, like my colleague might be able to also confirm. And standardization, this is where also we are we're quite, we're quite active to make sure that this, the, cha the ch actual connection and the, ch the charging uh, follows a standard. And that is not evident. And so we are not learning very much from the past. <laughs> but I think there are working groups that are doing this with, within SAE, within EuroK, within other, you know, Gamma in the United States that are looking at this, like, let's not reinvent the wheel. For example, let's use CCS um, for, like, combined charging system for for the planes as much as we're doing for for the fast charging of cars and then um what do we learn from the automotive is the chicken egg dilemma. What comes first, the charging infrastructure or or the vehicle? And how do we uh, how do we you know juggle within the two? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Meta-san, I saw you made much remarks on your sheet. Do you want to comment the four presentations? No, my remarks were uh, obviously taking some notes from what everyone was saying, but the one, well, there are several sort of uh, thoughts that run through one's mind. First, of course, with your opening comment, this is a, a long journey. We are very, very, we're very much, we're not even on at the start of the journey in some senses. And I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, 2008, there was a first test flight by Virgin Airways. And 2023, if my facts are correct, uh, sustainable aviation fuel accounts for only 0.1% of the total market. So. Over 15 years, we have made very limited progress. But listening to all of you, the one common thread that runs through, I think, all four presentations was the fact that we can succeed only through support, through collaboration and support. And the support required is not just from other entities like oil companies or um, uh, you know, uh, aircraft manufacturers, but it is support required from the government. And the government has to establish a level playing field. And in some senses, that is the key. So if I may just uh, pose a question, starting from in reverse, if I may, to um, Laura. Um, you have very clearly laid out the, the requirements that you need in order to scale up. Uh, but can you quantify that and can you suggest that, with that, uh, that there is a competitive model there for you to ensure that that scale up is going to be achieved? With subsidies, you mean? Yeah, well, let's say, so do you have an idea of what subsidies would be required if 
indeed those numbers that you are projecting are to be realized. Yeah, I, I can mention two examples, uh, one with subsidies and one without. So in Switzerland, uh, through subsidies from the Federal Office of uh, Civil Aviation, the importer of Pipistrel managed to um, purchase from Pipistrel about 15 aircraft and then have, has been able to lease these aircraft in different, uh, about 12 different um, airports. So we have the highest density of electric uh, airplanes in the, in the world, I think, um, Switzerland being small. And um, this is because he got a, um, a financing of up to, I think, 60 or 70 percent, and it allowed him to, to lease at a very interesting rate. So when I now, in my club in Lausanne, if I, when I rent the Bellis Electro versus a Robin or a PA-28, I, I save about 100 francs, so more or less 100 euros. And um, so it's very interesting because young pilots are able to then, to, to then rent a Bellis and make their first also 10, 15 hours of uh, flight training on the Bellis, and they're going to be saving, saving money. This wouldn't be possible if there was no, no subsidies. And as a matter of fact, we also uh, are finding it hard to place charging stations in Switzerland without subsidies. So I'm hoping that now we're going to receive a, a positive feedback from, from the same uh, federal um, aviation. And um, the other example is a, a company, Total Energies, it's an, an oil company. They have, let's say, in their vision, they want to be active today in the electrification of, of, of air mobility. And they have started creating the first network of charging infrastructure in France with our chargers. And so they have been the subsidy, let's say, they are the investor. And through that, thanks to, thanks to this, thanks to their vision, knowing that today they're going to be investing and not, the return on investment will not be in five years. Uh, it's probably going to be later because they're going to be earning money from the fuel, uh, from the energy that's consumed, that's uh, taken from the, through the charging station. So by, by creating the first infrastructure, though, it allows for more aircraft to fly. And this allows more aircraft, aircraft to be sold. And then ha having an infrastructure, you can have the next aircraft uh, manufacturer. They're going to be able to tell, OK, there's, an air, there's a charger there in that airport. We're going to be able to sell more aircraft around that area. So it becomes a virtual circle. So these are two examples. So the scale up, though, to make it more, uh, let's say, aggressive, it would have to be much more, mm, let's say, present from, uh, from the governments and not just uh, uh, subsidies based on the willingness of one country. So in Europe, for example, I would expect the EU to give grants um, in, a, in a more um, realistic way. One question, if I may, yes. for, to Ada. Um, Ada, you, you've, you sort of su suggested, or at least I thought you suggested, that you would prefer to go alone, although you indicated that if you wanted to go fast, you would go together. Um, so what is it? Do you want to go fast, or do you want to actually do it all by yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, of course, um, uh, if you want to go fast, then, um, yeah, I said you, you should go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. Um, by going fast, um, you may not be able to enjoy the journey, you know, uh, to, towards the destination. So we would like to go, go far, far and beyond, and, but we go together. And in this journey, I must say, um, um, we, in our discussion with all the governments, um, we do have a lot of support from these governments. And in VOLA, we like to call ourselves uh, pioneers. I think I have a few colleagues in the conference room uh, if you see them nodding their heads, then uh, yeah, we are pioneers. Then you can you, you can tell that they are my colleagues. So um, as we go through this journey, uh, discussing with different uh, governments, we have supports from them. They they kind of buy into the idea, but of course we also face certain challenges. Like um, electric aircraft is still pretty new in our part of the world, and um, the aircraft that I mentioned, we're still going through the type certification process. Um, and also, you know, before we can get the aircraft certified and the show uh, demonstrate to the, 
to our uh, customers that uh, electric aviation is safe. We need to get the aircraft in the air to demonstrate that it's, um, it's, it's, it's safe to fly in an electric plane. So um, this is something that uh, we're still in that dilemma, you know, trying to get the aircraft type certified. So uh, I hope I answered your question that, we, yes, we would like to go, to go far and we could do it together. Thank you very much. I have also a question. You knew you, you, you showed us a map in which you see your first market for Vola. But you are, uh, Hong Kong lies, is in China, so, but it is not the Chinese market you want to start. You, you will go not in the local market, but in the international market. Is this a, a true and what is the reason? Uh, yes, very absurd and thank you very much for the question as well. Um, Hong Kong is a very small place. Yes, our company is based in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is part of China. Uh, this aircraft is from China in Shenyang. Uh, we are also looking at um, markets in China, but at the moment we see the need um, of certain countries in Southeast Asia, and that's why we are uh, venturing into these countries first. But it doesn't mean that China is not on, on, on our map. Thank you very much. Um, let us go to the sustain, uh, sustainable aviation fuels. And um, I've not yet really seen so clear uh, roadmaps how you want to proceed. Maybe you can talk about this and a little bit more in detail. And uh, one of the aspects here is the competition with hydrogen. Uh, probably uh, you, you must be competing with a second new technology, which is not actually present on the podium, but uh, it is there, the, the elephant in the room, as we say it. Uh, maybe you can uh, comment on this. Uh, maybe you start, uh, Emoto-san. Yeah. Mm, our history shows that uh, the operation cost is dominant in the commercial use. This means the lowest price fuel should be dominant. And maybe in, in any future, the hydrogen cost is lower than SAF. So the hydrogen should be better for the customers. However, the electricity should be much lower than hydrogen price. So in far future, the electricity should be dominant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Niki Shumasan. Yes. So in my personal opinion, uh, there should be some demarcation, I believe. So I mean, for electricity, the, in any case, so source of the energy is from, come from solar or wind. Then uh, regardless of the energy, uh, like electricity or hydrogen or SF, so so, uh, all of the energy come from the solar on, or wind. However, for example, electricity is, can be directly converted from the solar or wind, so the efficiency is very high. However, there is a, uh, some, this, this, that is an advantage uh, in terms of efficiency of the conversion. However, as a, a disadvantage, uh, there is a no, uh, low, lower uh, energy uh, density, right? Then, as for the uh, SF, SAF, uh, there should be a long uh, way from the solar, uh, solar or wind power to, the, to combat SF. So there is a, a lower efficiency. However, liquid, liquid uh, fuel is a higher, uh, higher density. So, for, so SAF is very important for the long term long-haul uh, air, aircraft. However, electricity is uh, better for a short, uh, short, for, for a short haul uh, aircraft. So I believe so there should be a demarcation. Thank you very much. This gives me another, uh, rise, another question. Uh, we will probably have a symbiosis of both technologies, electricity and the safe. And uh, what is the share of the one, and where, where, where's the, the, the mixture? Where, where it stops? Uh, Laura explained us that she thinks that there will be planes with electricity with 90 passengers. So 
but probably passengers with uh, planes with 90 passengers could also be a, a nice, ma interesting market for Ceph technology. So, uh, so in this segment, there may be a di direct competition between these two technologies. Who and will win? In, in, in what will be the share? Where will be the border between the, the two technologies? Do you have an idea, or do you have think about that? It is, of course, a question to all of you for. I may agree with um, Mr. Hiroshi uh, san <laughs> about what wins if we're talking about winning, but I wouldn't put it this way, but it's really what's going to be the most economic for the operation. Now, I don't see a competition between electric flying and then um, staff flying, um, because like you were saying, there is, there is, it's two different markets and, uh, and there's a big limit of the battery. So whether it's a proportion, electric proportion um, thanks to hydrogen or electric proportion thanks to you know, um, batteries that have been charged from the grid, it's, it's for the electric and battery electric part is going to be um, limited to a certain number of seats. And then uh, that's why the two to four seaters up to eight is, is perfect for this. And the EVTOLs as well are, are all the EVTOLs, except a few are hybrid, but the other ones are all full electric. But um, the, the SAF and electric are actually going to have a good marriage with the, in the propulsion for the 19 seaters and the 30 seaters. So you're going to have the first, uh, let's say, 200 kilowatt hour battery for for the initial takeoff and then maybe some cruise time, just exactly like the hybrid cars today. You can do 50 kilometers and, uh, and the rest will be with fuel. And then the rest of the, of the whole will be with stuff. So this is what companies like Heart Aerospace are developing. So I do see a marriage in there. Oh, thank you very much. So this will be a symbiosis of the two technologies. I see the, all the speakers agree on that. I think we are running out of time, so I will wrap up the discussion. I must thank the speakers uh, very much. It, they gave us very interesting in, uh, views and uh, insights into um, uh, the, the, the pot, uh, topics which are actually under the development. And the typical question in, in this process is, what will be the future cost? Do we have costs uh, which will be affordable uh, for the normal passenger? And uh, if I would comment on this question, which was not <laughs> asked in the podium, um, uh, I would uh, say the following. We are actually discussing costs in a situation where you have a large amount of, of uh, fossil fuels available. Of course, in some cases, there is a CO2 price on top of it, but it is not really relevant in, in, a, in a world where we have really reduced our fossil fuels by 90%, 95%. The, the cost situation in such a world will look much, much different than today. And of course, we, we think this, this should be, in this morning we have heard from Vladislav that it may take longer until we, are, uh, we have get rid of fossil fuels, but some somehow sooner or later it will happen. And, and therefore, in this situation, the cost will differ fundamentally from that what we have today. And therefore, new technologies like SAF or hydrogen or uh, electrical airplanes, they, they will compete in a complete different way because the, the, the traditional competitor, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the conventional planes uh, will have also a big cost problem because there is not much fossil fuels anymore available. So with this, um, I think I should stop the discussion here. And uh, I think we should uh, thank all together our four speakers. And uh, it was a very wonderful session. Thank you very much.